Lincoln Pulp and Paper and the Millinocket Mills are unfortunate examples of a failure to, to uh, provide low cost energy to manufacturers. But the committee should also be aware that IECG is fully supportive of Maine's climate goals. These goals are very ambitious and as the Climate Council has noted, can only be achieved through the electrification of space heating and transportation. And then only if the electricity supplied to these sectors is from renewable zero emission generation sources. IECG wants to reiterate our continuing disappointment that the space heating and transportation sectors continue to rely on the electric ratepayers to help them achieve decarbonization. We have suggested numerous times in legislative forum and elsewhere that Maine will not achieve its goal without all sectors stepping up to pay their fair share. But policy makers continue to turn away from this basic element of climate justice. Since it appears that electric ratepayers will remain the easy targets to pay for achieving climate goals adopted by policymakers, the least those policymakers, including this committee, can do is to minimize the cost increases that ratepayers must bear while shouldering the burden for those other sectors. Um, I am not going to uh, even attempt to discuss the economics when, in a hearing where you've had Dr. Silkman and Woodbury speak to you. Um, so I'm going to skip over that part of my uh, testimony and uh, specifically uh, note a couple of other things. I expect the parties that, that will object to considering changes to the status quo are exactly who you, who you would expect, those who benefit the most from that status quo. The only difference is whether it is above market rates of return for new wires or above market rates of return for project developers. Main rate payers deserve better and Maine will fail at its climate mission without considering better options. We also note in passing that if nothing else, a, a public financing vehicle might at least let local Maine developers retain ownership of their projects, or at least the management of those projects, as opposed to selling out to investment firms, such as the Carlisle Group or BlackRock. IC wants to see Maine meet its emissions targets, but at the lowest possible cost. Um, we want the committee to take every opportunity to explore options that might be more cost effective than the status quo, whether it's transmission and distribution build out, grid resiliency and growth of distributed generation or grid scale renewable generation development. At the very least, the committee should take the time to seriously consider the proposal in LD 1634. We, we, understand, we appreciate that this is a major undertaking, but we think that uh, so is addressing climate change and we need to uh, all spend some serious time on this. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Be happy to answer any questions now at the work session. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. And there's a question from Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for being here, Mr. Hudson. Uh, is the IECG worried at all about the political nature that the main generation authority could take on? Um, I do think that that you that uh, Representative Foster's question to Dr. Silkman was a was a good question. I agree with that, and I think that we have to figure out how we can uh, try to insulate against um, it becoming a political creature. Um, you know, the Maine Turnpike Authority is a good model. The, the Maine Turnpike Authority in its history involving human beings perhaps is not as good a model as it could be, but that's because human beings are fallible humans. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stray into the spiritual, but I think that, that it's important that we, that we not avoid trying to improve things for fear of, of humans uh, acting uh, in their own personal self-interest. I think we just need to try to erect the structures to ensure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Any other questions from committee members? Um, I, I guess I wanna just ask, um, about the, on, on that last topic, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that there have been failures within um, sort of quasi-governmental agencies, uh, you know, consumer-owned entities, as well as investor-owned entities. Um, you know, I think of uh, Plant Vogel, which um, had some significant cost overruns in, in Georgia um, as, as, a, as a pretty significant example. So, um, it, it sounds like your your members are 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 concerned that um, you know one one thing is the cost of of capital and the co the access to lower cost capital which will be passed on to ratepayers and another thing is governance and um, is it fair to say that that yes we should work on the governance structures um, 
but that that would also be the case within the uh, the, the private sector and, and the, the pri private ownership market as well, that we need to watch it, watch for it there as well. Um, the IACG has uh, spent significant amount of its members' uh, mm -hmm. time and um, dues in intervening at, at the PUC and I also New England at FERC, just because of the fact that the private that uh, the private sector doesn't always watch out for the interests of the consumers. That and that and that's not to be you know I'm, I'm, that's not throwing mud at those particular uh, companies which uh, benefit from the current structures that we have in place. It's just a fact that we have to we have to continue to watch it. And we have to continue to police it, and we need a very we need effective institutions like a like a PUC that has uh, the resources it needs and the expertise it needs. And we need an OPA that while certainly representing uh, the most uh, disadvantaged members of uh, the consuming public also represents all consumers. And we've been uh, thankful that we've had a pretty good string of OPAs in this state. Great, thank you. And just as a follow-up, do you, do you view this as creating more competition in the generation space or, or less competition? Um, again, I think I, I, I hesitate to put my, my lawyer's judgment in the place of the, the judgment of two prominent uh, and preeminent economists in the state, but I, would say, I would don't know why it would, there would be less competition as a result of doing this. I think it's going to be a change, and I think those who um, seek to compete will have to, will have to figure out how to better compete in this model, but it may allow folks like Fortunat Mueller, Mueller to be able to better compete for example. Great, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hold on, I just messed up here somehow. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Mr. Hudson. Uh, my question would be most of the uh, clients that, you're, that you represent uh, they're out there fighting in the, uh, uh, I'll call it the capitalist world, uh, competing to try to put out the lowest cost product or service right. uh, with others of, of the same ilk. And that has seemed to work quite well for them uh, over the years. Why do you feel that all of a sudden that we need a quasi governmental entity uh, that we can't instill that same competition, which I think we do see uh, in in this uh, in this reality of uh, renewable energy production. Uh, well, thank you, Representative. It's a, it's a very good question, and uh, certainly uh, we uh, all of our members compete in the, in their in the various industries in which they're in. Um, uh, but they, we also understand that there are times when um, consolidation of power within a supplier uh, can uh, affect the ability for uh, folks to effectively compete um, for for our business, and um, so whether it's uh, transmission and distribution service or whether it's electrical supply, those are those are some basic. One is a monopoly; the other one's a pretty basic essential commodity. And um, and to the extent that you can de develop a better model of ensuring that that the the private sector that wants to provide those services can do so at the lowest possible cost and you have a way of, of passing those cost savings on to the ratepayers that have to, whether they're private residences or a large paper mill, um, have to buy, have to have that commodity in order to conduct their business in their daily lives. I think that, I think that is possibly a good thing. And we're, just to be clear, we're suggesting that, that this is, a, this is part in part a search for a better option than the status quo. It's not a suggestion that that one governmental procurement model is is the way that all things should be done, um, and it may be that there are that there are good reasons for not adopting everything that's in this bill. But uh, I think we fail to serve the ratepayers if we don't look whenever this committee discusses um, the status of trying to achieve social goals like climate change, figuring out how to do that in the lowest possible cost to ratepayers. That's, that's what we would ask. And that's what, what uh, we think is essential. And we, and we appreciate very much that the organic statute of the PUC contains that, uh, that uh, mandate from the legislature to reduce costs. And, and we think that they, while 
it's been difficult because every for every as Dr. Uh, Silkman said, for every um, mandate you give them that veers away from that reducing the lowest cost, they try they do first the mandate you ask and then they look to how to deliver it at the lowest cost. But um, you know you're going to find that that our frustration with the status quo is as exactly as I testified that it's it seems to be as much as we've tried to suggest that other sectors should bear some of this burden as well, we can't find um, a majority of main policymakers to agree with us and try to make it make that happen. So it, it appears to us that we are locked into paying as ratepayers for everything that we want to accomplish with regard to climate change. And if so, we need everyone to look at how we can do so at the lowest possible cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Foster, a follow-up? Yes, thanks. If I might uh, just follow up, uh, Mr. Hudson. Uh, so if this quasi-governmental authority were formed, what makes you think that future members of, or even present members of this committee might not decide that they would uh, legislate to uh, affect that authority in a way that may not be beneficial to ratepayers as well? Right. Um, I would, I would note that I think that, that to a large extent, some this committee and some of the institutions it's set up, at least in my experience in front of the committee, such as the Efficiency Main Trust, uh, the trust has been very successful, I think, in trying to, um, in trying to reduce the effect of uh, politics in its decision making and stick to the facts. And I think, and I think that. Um, uh, is apparent in I think the esteem in which this committee and, and certainly the IACG holds Mike Stoddard and his team. Um, so I would hope in a large part, that's because of both, uh, I think the thought that went into setting up the structure, but also the fact that um, some, of the, some of the very best people uh, uh, in the state have de dedicated their time to serve as on the board of that organization and helped it set up its, its uh, rules and regulations in, in a way to minimize that. Um, so I, I think that there are uh, ways of trying to look at structures to minimize that, that concern. That's a very real concern, Representative Foster. Um, so we would hope that as this goes forward, that as the discussion continues, that, um, that, that your concerns remain paramount in the minds of uh, the committee in terms of how to avoid whether whichever side of the political eye you're on, how to avoid um, uh, the, pl the political dynamic of the day from distracting the or organization from its, um, from its mission. And, and in our sense, we look at the mission as how to provide the lowest cost financing and then, and then finding a way to have ratepayers benefit from that lowest cost financing. And that's all we're about. We're not against private ownership, but if we're gonna end up paying for it, I think we have a right to demand that it be done at the lowest cost. Any follow up Representative Foster? Great. Um, just very quickly, Mr. Hudson, um, I know for residential customers um, who I tend to track a little bit more closely, uh, it's a little more visible on the PUC website, um, generation used to be more than half of the bill um, from the utility. Uh, when I came onto the committee in 2007, that was the case. Um, since then, that's actually flipped. So the, the T and the D, the delivery, is actually more than half of, of the bill. So um, I, I'm just trying to put this in, in, in that broader perspective. For, your, for, for industrial consumers, is that also the case? Uh, or what's the sort of rough ratio? Right, right. Um, so now we've switched from talking about um, what we pay for others, as, and, turn, and now to what we pay for our for our own use of electricity, um, because that those are two different different things. But with with regard to that question, um, Mr. Chairman, I think your, your surmise is correct that um, that you know if you look at uh, it's, it's no surprise to the members of this committee that you know, the uh, locational marginal price, the wholesale cost of electricity in ISO New England is, you know, anywhere between 3.4 to 4.1 cents per kilowatt hour. And, um, and you're looking at T and D costs, but you look at the all in costs in, 
in the various IOUs districts sits somewhere between you know, 12 and a half to 15, 15 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The, the difference primarily is transmission and distribution costs. Um, and unfortunately the transmission costs are not within the purview of this committee. Um, and, and so uh, there is little, little that the committee or the PUC can do to rein in those costs um, of transmission because that's done by FERC. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore the, the, what the state can regulate and what the state can advocate for with regard to uh, federal transmission rates, so. Great, I, I have an idea for transmission I'll talk to you about later. Any other questions? I understand that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right, seeing none, uh, we will go on to testimony from Steve Weems. Welcome, Mr. Weems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and other members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Weems, and I appear as the Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association of Maine. Uh, we are pleased to support LD 1634 and thank Representative Grahowski and the co-sponsors of this innovative legislation. We uh, agree with the essential rationale for this initiative, which is about the cost of capital. Establishing the authority will could save billions over the next 30 years. Important to distinguish between could and will, but it could save billions over the next 30 years. That would be billions, which will help us achieve our climate goals. Uh, I should note that some might question why we're here uh, appearing on behalf of this, but it's because as a broad coalition, we support all project sizes of all ownership models. And this is consistent with that part of our mission. One of the disadvantages of going eighth on the list is that everything else that's important has been said. So I'm gonna just zero in on two things briefly to, to emphasize them. One is the magnitude of the investment that's required. And Dr. Silkman has spoken to that eloquently in his report and in his testimony. But the consensus estimate is that we're need, going to need to invest $60 billion over the next 30 years in generating assets to achieve our climate goals. And most of that money is in capital costs. You heard his testimony about projects will shift from mostly fuel to capital assets. 80% 80, 80 capital costs for some, 90 for others. The cost of that capital is the determining factor on whether or not we're getting, going to get reasonably priced energy. And the distinctions that have been made today in the cost of capital, perhaps 3% for, as a placeholder for renewable, uh, for, excuse me, for tax exempt versus a blend of equity and private debt is enormous and will save us billions. The other thing I want to mention quickly is the competitive nature of this, which you were just talking about with, with Mr. Hudson. This is not like the main turnpike authority and that it would have a monopoly power. This would be a competitive entity in the marketplace having to win do projects because it can deliver them at the lowest possible cost to the ratepayer. And it will have the second uh, it's auxiliary benefit probably of because it doesn't have monopoly power and it has to win projects on the basis of their character and price that it will bring down the pricing for other competitors that are being financed with with more expensive capital so it's going to be a beneficial impact in both respects both in terms of the projects that it sponsors and completes and those that are done by others. With that, I'll stop. I'm out of my three minutes anyway and uh, and defer to the distinguished economists that appeared today before you. Thank you, Mr. Weems. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, I uh, appreciate your testimony. And we will go next to Susan Ely from the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Welcome. 
Thank you, Representative Mary, Senator Lawrence, distinguished members of the Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. My name is Sue Ely. I work for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Um, I, our offices are located in Augusta, but I'm testifying today uh, from my home in North Yarmouth. And I am pleased to testify in support of Representative Grohowski's Bill LD 1634. Um, I also sympathize with Mr. Weems going at the end of this line of distinguished speakers. Um, so again, I, I'm just gonna hit some high points. Um, the, the risk uh, and the task that is before us related to climate change is immense. Um, we all know that we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2050 and 80% by uh, 2030 and 80% by 2050 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, the states made a uh, commitment to increase our renewable portfolio standard to 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. These are enormous goals uh, and the consequences are also enormous uh, if we don't reach these goals. Uh, Mainers are already feeling the impacts of increasing temperatures and rising sea levels. Uh, changing weather patterns, all the result of climate change. Um, we, we must take bold action to get bold results. And I, I think that what Representative Grahowski has put before us is just that um, the breadth and depth of testimony um, from people who don't always agree on things, uh, I think speaks to um, the insightfulness of her bill um, in the way that she has taken the problem uh, to find the problem before us really is how much is it going to cost to achieve these goals and how can we do it in the most efficient and effective uh, way possible. So uh, I also am not going to try to um, rehash Dr. Silkman's um, statistics. I think he's made a really compelling case um, that this infrastructure uh, costs are many billions of dollars. Uh, I think the figure that he gave was 60 billion for generation storage and grid investments over the next 30 years. And an ability to finance that at a rate around 3% versus a rate of eight or 10 or 15 um, is something that we should give very careful consideration to um, because it seems like that's the only way we're gonna get where we need to get in the next, in the very short uh, future. Um, we think that the main generation authority um, is, the, is a solution that should be very carefully considered um, given the amount of investment in new renewable energy uh, infrastructure, uh, gener generation, storage. Um, for these reasons, NRCM supports the bill and encourages you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ely. Any questions for Sue from the committee? I have a very important question. Is that uh, is that Bradbury Mountain behind you, or what is what is that view that I'm seeing? It is. It's actually you can see my dad's farm from from the <laughs> from the top. Wow! Excellent. Okay, I'll I'll look for it next time I'm up there. Thought I recognized that. Any other questions? Other important and burning questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we will turn next to testimony in opposition uh, to the bill. And uh, first up is uh, Mr. Jeremy Payne. Welcome, Jeremy. And I think you're you're muted, um, although I can't. For some reason, I don't see the take two. There we go. Sorry about that. Right. Uh, the old double mute. Um, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jeremy Payne. I'm the executive director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, here to testify in opposition to 1634, uh, as it appears to be a solution in search of a problem as it relates to seeing new clean energy supply cost effectively developed in the state. We know it works. We know how to do it to ensure new megawatts of Maine, Maine clean energy reach commercial operation at very competitive prices. If we've learned anything in the last two years since the 129th Maine Legislature's passage of LDs 1494 and 1711, it's that, clean it's that the clean energy marketplace has identified Maine as a great place to deploy its capital. Um, what is in question is whether that reputation remains intact, depending on what you all decide to do here in the coming weeks. Um, we've heard from uh, Chairman Bartlett uh, on multiple occasions that the commission has seen very robust competition for the grid scale procurement that they oversee and administer. 
believe he had said that there was something north of 80 bids for the first tranche, and he seemed to indicate the second tranche uh, was receiving similar competitive attention. Um, the bill would replace the private marketplace with a government-run authority and ultimately shift project development and construction risk onto ratepayers. The existing procurement processes that the PUC oversees ensures that ratepayers benefit from the output from an operational project. However, this authority would also place the pre-operation and construction-stranded asset risk on the ratepayer-backed authority. So in other words, if the authority makes a bad bet on a project that fails for any number of reasons, ratepayers are on the hook for that cost, even if it ultimately produces zero electricity. This creates an additional burden of risk that ratepayers themselves would be backstopping. Um, notably, the authority would also have no federal income tax liability and seemingly would not be able to utilize federal tax policies like the PTC and the ITC that help deliver lower project costs for all consumers. The bill also contemplates very prescriptive uh, procurements, um, but, uh, well, the bill itself contains very little information as to how those numbers were arrived at. Certainly, Representative Grahowski confirmed my suspicion that they could indeed be found in Rich Silkman's report from a few years ago. Um, but we just encourage the committee to drill down to better understand what, how, why, and whether those targets actually achieve the state's goals. In other words, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, um, but I'm not sure that this committee or any committee, frankly, should just be taking one person's word and assume that it's correct. Um, additionally, the bill would create tax exempt status for all generation authority projects, which means host communities would no longer receive new commercial taxable value. Uh, as this committee knows full well throughout our pursuit of a cleaner energy future, one of the most consistent reasons that communities approve projects is their ability to help stabilize or lower property taxes. Um, I will say one of the reasons that 20-year contracts have been attractive is that solar and wind projects um, often benefit from technological advancements that improve efficiency and output. So another way for main consumers to continue receiving those benefits beyond the 20-year term would be to sign another contract. Um, and further, I'm also quite sure that the awardees of those contracts associated with the passage of LD 1494 would be more than happy to negotiate a follow-on contract with the PUC. Um, revenue certainty is as important to owner-operators of those projects as pricing certainty is for residential ratepayers uh, and commercial businesses as well. Um, to be clear, this, is a, this bill would represent a seismic shift in Maine's energy policy by asking private companies to compete with state government. Uh, and as such, we would encourage the committee to tread lightly and have a very robust conversation about whether this authority is the right approach to achieve the state's climate goals. Uh, so with that, we respectfully urge you to vote ought not to, ought to pass, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Are there questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Payne. I find myself in a rather strange position here, but uh, I will ask, uh, you represent uh, those who are installing generating capacity. Uh, I, could you briefly explain, uh, in layman's terms, if you will, why you would be against having the opportunity to borrow this cheap money through the formation of this authority to... Uh, it's so. not entirely clear to me, or, and maybe I misread the bill and I'm, and I'm misunderstanding it, but it's not entirely clear to me that's the only thing it's doing. I, I think you heard Fortunat Mueller talk about that there's references to development in the actual section, uh, section of the statute. If it really was just a, here's a pot of money that you can borrow cheaper, I'm not sure that we have an objection to it. Um, but if it is in, an authority that is created to introduce or create additional competition in the marketplace, through a government-run authority that would be competing with private companies, I don't think that's a, a level playing field. Other questions? All right, seeing none, uh, appreciate your testimony, Mr. Payne. And um, I don't, uh, that was it for opponents, as far as I'm aware. Um, I'll give a chance at the end again. Um, but next up will be testimony neither for nor against, beginning with the public advocate, Barry Hobbins, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. My name is Barry Hobbins and I'm the public advocate with the Office of the Public Advocate. And I'm here today to testify neither for nor against LD 1634. This bill is a relatively large initiative and difficult 
for some to digest so late in the session. On the one hand, uh, such a proposed authority, quasi-state ownership approach of electric generation would bring the state's lower cost capital to the development of renewable energy. Studies indicate this would theoretically lower the cost of the energy produced and could thereby assist in meeting the state's climate change goals in a more cost-effective manner while not putting a significant financial burden on the main rate payer. On the other hand, the state and federal governments have made a public policy decision to allow competition in the electric generation industry. And the approach which is proposed here would arguably be contradictory to that policy decision. While the current policy approach is designed to foster a free market, renewable energy providers, developers do frequently require long-term government contracts to construct these projects. A consequence of this bill is that it undercuts the competitive dis distribution of energy in the marketplace, which is currently very robust. It could be argued that this legislation would place the state proposed authority as a competitor in that market. This would be a major policy change. If there is interest from the committee, the OPA would advise potentially amending this bill to a resolve and designate it for further study. It is the opinion of the Office of the Public Advocate that this, that this bill uh, has possibilities, but it, whether or not it goes too far would have to be discussed at a later time. One of the intended purposes of deregulation was to keep ratepayers protected from potentially poor decision-making by transmission and distribution entities. This bill would put them possibly back on the hook despite the lower surcharge but this time through a state-run entity. I want to commend those who brought forward the bill, Representative Gorkowski, and those who spoke. We very seldom have distinguished economists appear either for or against a piece of legislation in my years in the legislature. And I just want to commend those who spoke for the bill to, to know that it was a robust discussion, which I think is very important for the process. That is uh, my opinion, uh, public advocate's opinion. We thank you for the time, attention, and consideration of this testimony. And if you have any questions, Mr. Chair, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Questions from the committee? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hobbins, for being here this morning. Uh, <clears throat> we've heard this morning quite a bit about the uh, uh, this bill being a positive for ratepayers that it would lower uh, costs. Uh, I'm wondering because usually your office and, and your successor, I'm sure, will be charged with the same. Go out to represent ratepayers. Uh, I, I, quite often or most often against private concerns uh, when rates are affected negatively for the ratepayers or other issues. I'm wondering if you could, how would that go with, with this uh, quasi-governmental agents uh, authority as far as your office is concerned if in fact some of their decisions went the wrong way for ratepayers? Is that, uh, is there a issue with you advocating for the ratepayer against the uh, intergovernmental uh, authority or how would that work going forward? Thank you. Well, ideally, Mr. very good question, Representative Foster, as always. Uh, I, again, this is a major policy decision. And because it's a major policy, policy decision, uh, the Office of the Public Advocate um, 
finds itself um, arguing that we might not have the perfect, if you're going to have this type of approach, there needs to be further study. Anytime you have um, an office that looks to try to save money for the ratepayer, uh, in, the, in the past, it was what is the cheapest amount without looking at the futuristic issues involving uh, fossil fuels, involving the economy, involving the environment. And so my approach has been more aggressive, taking some positions that quite frankly would surprise some people, I'm sure. But again, you have to look at the totality of the situation, but I do agree with you. It puts whoever the policymakers are, uh, it, it, you know, in a very difficult position because you can argue this bill from both ways. And I want to see if something is going to pass, which it could uh, because of the environment that's out there and the distrust for utilities that is out there in the public that I see, um, we want to make sure it's done right. And so I would hope this committee would consider uh, taking some humble advice from someone who's been involved with many, many studies. And some of them turn out pretty good. The law, the law, the law and the committee of jurisdiction um, has done some good work. So I, I probably, probably not the right answer for you, but that's basically how I feel, how, how my office feels. But thank you for the question as always. Any follow up? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I wasn't expecting uh, any particular answer. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions for the public advocate? All right. Thank Seeing you very none, much. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy that nice porch you're on. Or it's it's uh, overlooking the Saco River. So ah. it's overlooking a deck and it's oh, kind of nice here at home. Very thank nice. You. All right. Enjoy. Uh, next up, we have testimony neither for nor against from the governor's energy office. Welcome, Melissa Winnie. Hey, good afternoon, Representative Barry, Senator Lawrence, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities Technology. My name is Melissa Winnie and I'm the energy policy analyst for the governor's energy office, testifying neither for nor against LD 1634. Uh, I'd first like to state and, and perhaps restate that the governor's energy office is committed to achieving the state's clean energy and climate goals and requirements. Uh, we understand and, you know, as was recognized in our, our main renewable energy goals market assessment and the main climate council's climate action plan, that meeting these requirements will necessitate development of additional renewable energy generation in the state and across the regional electricity grid. In relation to meeting these goals, uh, the GEO does have some concerns about the wide sweeping nature of this legislation and potential unintended consequences of this vast change in ownership structure of the state's electricity generation. Um, the GEO would like to ensure that there is a clear understanding of how the details of this proposed authority would be implemented and staffed, um, any impacts to the energy markets and clean energy industry, tax implications for municipalities and the state and associated ratepayer costs or risk impacts of this legislation. Um, seconding what um, the public advocate just said, uh, we may uh, also recommend that um, this be turned into a resolve for a study to ensure that we are all clear in understanding what the impacts and outcomes of this change and of the proposed legislation would be. Um, so again, we advise that the committee carefully and prudently review this proposal and ensure that we have a clear understanding of the impacts before making a decision um, and moving forward. So thank you for your consideration and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee for the governor's energy office? All right, seeing none, we will move on to Michael Stoddard of the Efficiency Main Trust. Good afternoon, Chairman Barry, Chairman Lawrence, members of the committee. My name is Michael Stoddard. I am the Executive Director of the Efficiency Main Trust. I appreciate the opportunity to testify to you today uh, on LD 1634, neither for nor against the legislation. 
Uh, it won't surprise you to hear me say that our chief interest is in finding ways to ensure a 10 to 20 year transition to beneficial electrification for both heating and transportation. Uh, and at the same time, ensuring that the electric supply is decarbonized under that same period. And so it's critical that we explore every option and every avenue to achieving that goal at the lowest cost. We appreciate that this legislation is taking another look at a possible avenue to do that. Uh, we also appreciate that the discussion talks about the potential value of independent quasi agencies. Uh, as you know, Efficiency Maine has had a pretty good run of playing a role to try and bring value to the state economy and the environment and the ratepayers. And we think that there's a lot of merit to what you heard other people testify to about insulating these organizations from politics. And um, it, it's, it's critically important. It's been incredibly valuable to us to have some of that arm's length distance. And hopefully uh, we've been able to um, handle the, the uh, assignments we, that have been entrusted to us uh, in an in a efficient way and an effective way. And we think that that can be very valuable to achieving the goals that the state has when it comes to energy. Um, we are fine with the role that is mentioned in the legislation about aggregating the attributes and the capacity that would come from projects and marketing them. As people may know, Efficiency Main Trust is a participant in the Ford capacity market at ISO New England. It uh, would not be a big stretch for us to add some more capacity to that resource and also the reporting that goes with it. Uh, and I think we could similarly, without much trouble, do the same for renewable energy credits if that was asked of us. Um, finally, I would echo a, a prior comment that was made about the targets that are prescribed uh, for the uh, volume of megawatts and, and uh, of both renewable energy and storage. And I would just say in our experience, um, it never ceases to amaze me how much um, we need to uh, take stock after a couple of years based on what reality has shown us and recalibrate. And so I would make sure if, if you do this, you have some provision to check on those numbers and, and be able to recalibrate as appropriate. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, any questions from the committee? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stoddard for being here. Uh, Earlier, it was uh, suggested, and I agree, that uh, your uh, group, quasi-governmental authority, has done quite well in, in uh, sticking to your uh, charge. And uh, however, I would ask you if, if I am wrong when I assume that you, your group and is not immune to uh, the changes that might be brought by future members of this committee or future politicians or legislators uh, to sway you, if you will, by statute away from what uh, you currently see as your goals. And, and likewise, uh, I would assume that I wouldn't be wrong in the, uh, thinking that that might happen to any agency, uh, governmental authority such as your own. Thank you. Um, I, if your question is, ain't that so, um, I, I, would, I would agree that um, you know, we're created by the legislature. We are a creature of the of the legislature uh, of the legislation, and so we're certainly subject to the changing views uh, of policymakers as they evolve over time. Um, I, I think I'm echoing some earlier testimony about the value of having a good board that is well chosen and has some diversity to it um, and, and itself is somewhat insulated from uh, political influence. And, and that has been, and you know, there's the, there's the appointment and confirmation process that goes through your committee. And I think that your committee has always taken that job very seriously and has made sure that the folks who were put on our board were qualified and we're going to be impartial and understood the importance of that impartiality. Um, so I don't think there's a foolproof mechanism or system, um, but I do think that um, the fact that we were established with the word trust in our name and that there was a lot of attention 
put at the outset to our remaining impartial. Um, I feel that both parties uh, and the and the elected officials from both parties have taken that seriously and have kind of provided checks and balances over the years to try to preserve that impartiality as best as possible. And I felt that it it worked. Uh, they they honored that and respected that during the. LePage administration and when the Republicans had control of the legislature. And I feel that like they've honored it during the subsequent administration and when the Democrats have been in control of the legislation. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful that both parties have honored that and have kind of held each other in check when there may have been suggestions to try and uh, influence it more and more with policies uh, that, as you say, uh, the legislature is within its right to adopt and and Im impose upon us but i think it has done that in a very prudent and limited way over over our tenure any other questions all right seeing none thank you mr stoddard and up next we have neil goldberg from the maine municipal association welcome thank you Representative Barry, Senator Lawrence, and members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. My name is Neil Goldberg, and I am providing provisional testimony, neither for nor against LD 1634 on behalf of MMA. Uh, after the LPC convenes next week, uh, if their position does not align with my comments today, I will be submitting amended testimony. Uh, much has already been said in favor um, and in opposition to this aid, uh, authority. Uh, we think that there is great possibility here. It is ambitious um, and it will likely create the financial support to get these very expensive projects, as we just heard, off the ground. Um, and these are projects that are unlikely um, to go anywhere uh, at the municipal level without some state support. And this authority could, could be that. Uh, but we do have some objection to how um, it is handled or its, its behavior. And specifically, the exemptions that are offered to it um, in regards to tax payments to municipalities. Uh, as Dr. Silkman mentioned, these, this is going to be extensive, it's going to be broad, and they're going to be uh, valuable investments. And taking these properties off the municipal tax rolls will have an impact. And so as we weigh the savings to rate payers, as the governor's energy office mentioned, we should weigh uh, the impacts to property taxpayers as well. Um, and so with some uh, adjustment to those exemptions, uh, this bill might be more favorable, but at the moment, um, we stick with neither for nor against, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Thanks for your testimony. And uh, up next, neither for nor against, we have the chair of the Public Utilities Commission, Bill Bartlett. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Representative Barry, uh, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee. I am Bill Bartlett, chair of the PUC, testifying neither for nor against LD 1634. As you've heard, the act would require the authority to develop and own 2,000 gigawatt hours uh, of renewable energy, which comes out to about 1,000 megawatts if you were to base that on solar capacity as well as 100 megawatts of energy storage, and then sell the energy it erects into the wholesale markets. Under the act, the authority's board would determine its revenue requirements, including debt payments and operating expenses. And the commission would be required to authorize a surcharge on the bills of all electricity customers in the state for those expenses, uh, regardless of the prudence of the decision-making uh, of the authority. Depending on the cost of the projects and market prices, the authority could well create real value for ratepayers. It could also create significant costs. Uh, what is clear is that the state's ratepayers would bear all of the risks of the authority's decision making and operations. The ratepayer risk in funding uh, the authority as specified in the act is different from that which occurs through long-term contracts at specified prices. Set co such contracts by their nature allocate risks among the state's ratepayers as well as project developers. Under these contracts, the ratepayers are exposed to the risk of market price fluctuations, while the project developers bear the risk uh, of cost overruns, operating expenses, and so on. Uh, it's also, I think, worth noting, as others have mentioned, 
that when you're creating a government agency as a sole buyer, and particularly where uh, it's mandated to procure a certain amount, um, that could have significant uh, impacts on the market and affect the overall competitiveness of the market. So that is certainly worthy of some uh, further analysis. The commission suggests that the committee consider this bill in the context of the state's overall policies regarding renewable energy development and other climate change goals here in Maine. Uh, the commission is in the process of conducting a second of two required solicitations for renewable energy under 3210G, which will result in a procuring about 800 megawatts of renewable generation. In addition, the NEB program, which uh, you're all uh, considering changes to uh, this session, uh, currently has 1,000 megawatts of projects with NEB agreements and over 2,600 megawatts uh, of projects in the queue. Uh, so a significant amount of that uh, may well come online. To put this in context, uh, Maine's peak load is approximately 2,100 megawatts, and Maine currently has 4,500 megawatts of generating capacity in the state, making Maine a net exporter. The picture is further complicated by transmission constraints which create the potential for negative market prices and or periodic curtailment of operations with a significant influx of new resources. Such negative pricing would increase above market costs for ratepayers under existing long-term contracts. Given transmission constraints, it'll be important to get the timing of development right, factoring in realistic estimates of both load growth uh, and pod the timing of possible transmission uh, upgrades and expansion uh, in and out of the state. Uh, at the commission, we urge the committee to carefully consider how the creation and operation of a generation authority might impact the state's long-term strategy to meet its renewable energy goals and how it fits in with the broader context of Maine's energy policy. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. It will certainly be available for work session. Thank you, Chair Bartlett. Are there questions from the committee? And... Uh, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Bartlett, for appearing before us here today. Uh, my question is similar to what I had for the Office of the Public Advocate. I'm wondering if you could uh, speak to how you think the PUC would work uh, in relation to this authority and uh, their their uh, goals and and uh, according to this uh, legislation. Thank you. It's not clear that we have a significant role other than passing through the cost to ratepayers um, as they're determined by the authority. So I don't see a significant oversight role um, other than um, it's sort of administrative in advancing, um, making sure that their bill gets paid uh, through ratepayer expenses. Certainly there would be a role in rate design, obviously, but um, yeah, that applies to all rates. If I could uh, follow up, Mr. Chair. Yep, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Bartlett. Uh, so to throw out an example, uh, when, when the PUC puts out bids for generating capacity, uh, I'm assuming now this authority will be doing some of that. Uh, would the PUC have any uh, uh, oversight of how those bids came in uh, for that generating capacity? Or is this, or am I completely wrong on that, that the, uh, that wouldn't be the, what it, in fact is happening uh, when this authority uh, offers funding and, and owns generation. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, we have some existing long-term contracting authority, which you know, if you go through this, you may well want to repeal. Um, 3210C, for example, requires us to open a, a proceeding every few years to consider um, contracts. Uh, so this authority would be doing the procuring. I don't, I don't, the way I read it, I don't see us as having a role at this, at that point. It, it would be up to the authority to do the procurement. Uh, one of the concerns we have when we do procurements, which I think apply to this, is anytime you have uh, a fixed amount that you're requiring, um, if the market gets tight, you're going to be subject to the potential of costs getting ratcheted up. So that's why I, I sort of flag the issue of considering uh, whether it's us or the authority doing these kinds of large procurements, having some flexibility so that the authority could simply um, reject bids if they, if they felt that the, the market wasn't competitive as opposed to requiring them to procure X amount um, in a certain period of time 
just in case there's you end up with a much tighter supply than or a tighter competition than you expect. Thank you. Representative Foster, any follow up? All set. Uh, we'll go to Representative Cuddy next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Bartlett, for being here today. The um, we've talked about the, the contracts that are currently put out, and typically there is my understanding they're 20 year contracts get put out. What are there any benefits uh, to main rate payers um, who have paid for these contracts over the 20 years uh, for years 21, 2, 3, 4? Ad nauseum. Not directly. I mean, at that point, you're no longer contracting for the energy. But my understanding is that part of uh, the impetus behind these contracts is to provide the financing to get them built, uh, recognizing the beneficial um, impact of having that increased supply in the marketplace and having those additional recs in the marketplace. So uh, when we finance, it's uh, for that period of the contract. What I don't know um, is uh, from a developer's perspective, whether they are in fact recovering all of their costs in those 20 years um, or, um, you know, and that's also a point that most of our contracts are for energy only. So there may be other sources of revenue. So it's not, um, so I'm not, I don't know for sure how much of their overall costs are recovered through the energy contract that we're signing. Uh, as opposed to other potential sources of revenue, including those that would accrue after the 20 year period. Thank you. Chair Bartlett, is your concern about uh, long-term contracting and the sort of supply and demand impact, is that based on an assumption that, that you would still be required under 3210C to, to procure uh, the same overall uh, um, supply? Um, and that, and that there would be a, a diminishing number of uh, proposals for that same supply? Well, I just think if you've, if you've made a decision to create an authority who's going to do the procurement and particularly on such a large scale, um, it, it seems like it, it might be duplicative or futile for us to, to be putting out a separate contracting process every three years. We can certainly, as the law remains in place, we'll continue to do it and you never know what might commit. Uh, certainly there may be enough projects out there at a reasonable cost um, that that's worth doing. I, just, I don't know. Great. And as a follow-up under current law, remind me, are you able to declare uh, an, uh, an RFP to be, uh, to, to, to not be competitive under 3210C? Uh, to be a third to ten C, we don't have to accept any bids. Mm -hmm. So we we are doing that as a straight ratepayer benefit impact. So if we conclude that uh, none of the bids provide a ratepayer benefit, we don't have to accept any of them. Uh, mm -hmm. If we get a lot of bids that do, we can accept as many bids as as are beneficial. Got it. Um, so to the extent that there might be um, more um, more generation being built uh, because you have this new entity and the existing players, is it conceivable that you have sort of more uh, bids, more sharpening of the pencil uh, for that limited uh, procurement? I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, 3210C, I think, has had um, limited success in part because there's a preference in the statute for 10-year contracts. And that seems like it hasn't been enough um, in a lot of cases to get the good pricing. Um, 20 year contracts um, seem to be the norm. I don't know whether you need where between 10 or 20, where there might be a magic place um, to minimize the ratepayer risk, but um, 10 seems to be more challenging to get the, the cost down. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, thank you, Chair Bartlett. And I'm um, just going to ask if anyone is um, interested in testifying that has not been able to do so. Um, anyone who's currently an attendee that uh, wants to raise their hand and testify that has not already done so, now would be the time to do that. And seeing none, uh, that will conclude our hearing on LD 1634. Um, We'll uh, schedule it for a work session in uh, the coming weeks, and uh, it'll, we're we're moving quickly, so it may be it may be as soon as next week, possibly. Um, we are going to take a break for lunch. Uh, I'd like to ask the committee. We do have one more bill to hear. Uh, I think there were 
15, a dozen or 15 or so to testify on that. Uh, last I checked, no, it was, sorry, it was only 10. Uh, but still, it'll, you know, that'll take at least half an hour. Um, would you like to break for a full hour now and come back at uh, 1.45 after lunch? Or do you want to just make it 45 minutes? Come back at 1.30. 45 would be my preference. 145? No, so 45 minutes. Uh, so 1.30. Oh, 45 minute break. Okay. Yep. yep. Come back at 1.30. Any other thoughts? I'm going to be uh, going over to labor and housing. We have like 15 or 16 public hearings today. So I'm, I've missed three of them, I think, so far. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> but if, if you need me back for a quorum or something, the shoot me a text. Thank you. Representative Cuddy, I don't know how you guys do it going back and forth between two committees. Um, any other thoughts? All right, so let's we'll make it 1.30 as Representative Wadsworth suggested and uh, please get away from the screen and uh, enjoy lunch break, turn off your, your video and your audio. We will be back at 1.30 to take up uh, LD 1596. See you all then.
Hi, hey, Jordan, are you back? Sorry, I, I had my yes, sound yes. off. Are you there? Yep. yep. Great. So I'm doing the hearings this afternoon. And you had sent out an email with um, the, um, sorry, the people who are going to testify this afternoon. Is that correct? Or are we doing work sessions? Uh, it's a public hearing. So I did send out the testimony list this morning. And Senator, um, for, for the one bill that we do have, LD 1596, um, I have been in touch with the sponsor, Representative Chiazzo, and he, um, I think, will be joining us momentarily if he hasn't already. Okay, so all you guys did this morning was 1634? That's right. Yes. See what happens when I leave? <laughs> well, in fairness, you were there for a part of it. <laughs> yeah, for the end of it, but uh, okay. <laughs> But you were paying ago. you were paying attention, Senator. So I, I would like to remind everyone there was a significant delay due to a technical Thank malfunction. You. When in doubt, blame it on the technology. <laughs> that was real. Is that a uh, a wardrobe <laughs> malfunction other than my wearing a Vermont t shirt? <laughs> I see that Representative Chiazzo is is uh, available. I'm moving him over now, beaming Great. him up. <clears throat> Thank you. Senator Lawrence, do you have the, the list already? I don't have the list, but let me find it. I can send it to you again if needed. Nope. Um, and I see Representative Chiazzo has not changed a bit. I did shower this morning though, Senator, as you did as well. So I'm just, just for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So if we're all set, we have one, two, three, four, seven. Great. We're all set to go. Um, so we're back uh, with the uh, Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. And we're holding our public hearing on our second bill today. Um, it is LD 1596. Um, an act to reduce the nameplate capacity and distrib distributive generation. Pardon me, let me start again. An act to reduce the nameplate capacity of distributed generation resource, pro resource projects to qualify for net energy billing and decrease tariff rates for customers participating. Distinguished colleagues of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, I am Chris Chiazzo and I represent House District 28, which consists of the good people of Western Scarborough. As a former member of this committee, I regret, as you've heard from multiple people in the past, and Senator Lawrence has alluded to, that I can't hand out the um, uh, traditional treats at the virtual hearing, but I promise to do so when we are all together in person again. With that, I am pleased to present LD 1596, which is an act to reduce the nameplate capacity of distributed generation resource projects to qualify for net energy billing and decrease tariff rates for customers participating in the net energy billing programs. Uh, as Senator Lawrence uh, had mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of serving on this committee, committee when LD 1711 was passed in the 129th legislature. And as I recall, one of the primary motivations for moving that bill forward was the desire to remove administrative barriers and encourage more development of renewable energy sources, including solar energy. I think in this regard, the legislation we passed that session, including LD 1494, was successful. Uh, however, I have become increasingly aware that in our enthusiasm last session, we may not have thought as critically as perhaps we should have when drafting 1711. The concern was heightened uh, when I read about the Public Utilities Commission's order dismissing the bids for the distributed generation procurement program last year as uncompetitive and unduly expensive. The Commission's order criticized the design of the DG procurement process, clearly implying that the legislature should take further action. I also heard about the Commission's report on the ratepayer impact of the current net energy billing programs, representing a 20% rate impact over time. 
I understand that the committee has now received information from the commission that states the impact from such projects could be as high as 50% if a higher than expected percentage of existing proposed projects become a reality. In my opinion, this is not a case of having too much of a good thing, but it's a case of, uh, excuse me, but it's, it's a matter of paying too much for that good thing and not being able to afford all the other good things that we'd like to have move forward. I continue to support for the development of renewable energy in Maine. However, that is only one, among, one thing among many that we must do to address our climate goals. As a result, I offer this bill for the committee's consideration. I understand that this is only the latest bill proposing changes to, Ma to Maine's NEB programs, and several have suggested even repealing the DG procurement program, while others have focused primarily, primarily on the NEB programs. I also understand that the committee now has a subcommittee led by Senator Lawrence to discuss various options for actions by this legislature. I hope that the subcommittee can review my bill, see if it adds any helpful ideas for their discussions. And having been removed from the discussions for some time now, I will leave the technical details of this bill to the interested parties, whether positive or negative, in the hopes that their current observations and comments may be helpful to the NEB subcommittee as it decides how best to proceed. The intent of LB 1596 as drafted proposes to reduce the nameplate capacity of a distributed generation resource project that qualifies for net energy billing from less than five megawatts to less than one megawatt. It allows a project subject to a contract entered into prior to January 1, 2021 that previously qualified for net energy billing and no longer qualifies upon the enactment of this provision to continue to qualify for net energy billing as determined by the Public Utilities Commission based upon the project's viability as indicated by developer investment and achievement of project milestones. This bill further proposes to establish a decreasing tariff rate schedule for customers participating in the commercial and institutional NEB tariff rate program. It also reduces the time in which customers participating in the program may receive the bill credit from 20 years to 10 years. Finally, this bill also directs the commission to offer a one-time buyout to commercial or institutional customers who shared a financial interest in the distributed generation resource project that has not yet started commercial operations on the effective date of this bill. Now, I recognize there's a lot to unpack in this bill and I offer it to provide as many ideas to the committee as possible while you work through the NEB uh, issues this year. Much like our original intent on LD 1711, I suggest the committee's goal should be to maintain progress on growing Maine's renewable energy generation while keeping in mind the resulting cost to ratepayers. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss my concerns regarding the unintended consequences of my actions last session. I respect the committee has a lot on its plate this session, but hope that this bill will stimulate further constructive discussions on these goals. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for uh, Representative Chiazzo? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you and welcome back, uh, Representative Chiazzo. Uh, I know I don't even have to ask if you missed us or not. So the, uh, <laughs> the bill you've put forward is, is uh, remarkable in your clairvoyance on what some of the issues that the subcommittee was considering are. I'm wondering, first of all, uh, as you stated, the committee didn't foresee the cost that uh, changes to 1711 were going to put forth towards the ratepayers should bids have been accepted on net energy billing and other issues. Do you know uh, how much of an adjustment this bill represents in, in comparison uh, as far as ratepayer costs? That, would, would result if this were passed as is? Uh, unfortunately, Senator Foster, Foster, Representative Foster, first of all, thank you for that uh, very kind welcome. I do miss you guys. Um, I listened in on some of the, the testimony in the previous bill and, and uh, certainly do miss the, 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 the detailed discussions, uh, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't really do an analysis or, uh, you know, um, perhaps some of the other interested parties have done, uh, done some work to see exactly what the impact is, but you know, I think like a lot of the, the legislature that we put forward, it's a pendulum, right? It swings back and forth. And I think very rarely do we, do we are we able to find that sweet spot um, right out of the gate. So 
Um, I, I, I stand behind my commitment to alternative energy. Uh, I think solar is a, a great thing. I think we need to have it. I think we need to, to keep pursuing that as policy. Uh, I think we just may have overshot a little bit on the cost side of things. And I think um, hopefully we can recognize that as a, as a, as a policy body, uh, make those corrections and bring that back in line so that we can continue moving forward with, with advancing the renewable energy program, which we absolutely need to continue with for sure. If I may answer Chief. your question, Representative Foster, or do you want to? Uh, I, I would like to follow up if I could. Okay. Mr. Chair. Thank Go you, uh, Representative Chiazzo. Uh, with that in mind, if you're, if if Senator Lawrence's subcommittee were to decide to use your bill as a uh, a document to uh, uh, make possible changes uh, that they are, that the subcommittee is considering, would you be open to? Uh, 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 amendments such as, you know, possibly extending some of the changes you've made further and or even including the uh, uh, getting rid of the DG portion of uh, previous legislation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have the utmost, utmost confidence and faith that, that this committee and Senator Lawrence leadership on the NEB subcommittee will find uh, the, the, the right resolutions. And if it means you know, taking a, a piece of this bill and adding it or modifying it. I mean, I'd be honored if it was the basis for the solution, of course, but really the whole goal here is just to present some other alternatives, some other options and spur that discussion to, to, to really kind of dig into what the other options are uh, and what, what other ideas might be out there to, to try and help us resolve the problem the best way we can for the state and the ratepayers. Apologies for a second. Let me, let me try and close that door. Any follow-up, Representative Foster? Also. So I appreciate uh, Representative Chiazzo, people calling this Senator Lawrence's subcommittee, but I do not recall appointing a chair of the subcommittee. <laughs> Barry also serves on the subcommittee, as does Representative Foster. So, um, you know, I think we are all equally responsible for its successful outcome. No disrespect meant to any of the other subcommittee members, for sure. For sure. Other questions for Representative Chiazzo? Seeing none, thank you very much. Good luck on uh, LVA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see you guys again. You're welcome. Good to see you, Chris. Uh, now we will go to proponents of this bill, uh, this bill having no co-sponsors. We'll go to uh, Tony Buxton from the Industrial Energy Consumer Group. Tony? Thank, thank you, Senator Lawrence, uh, Representative Barry, distinguished members of the committee. Good afternoon. I am Tony Buxton uh, of Portland from Pretty Flaherty, representing the IACG here today. As you know, the IACG is an association of larger energy consumers uh, focused on the price and reliability of electric supply and since 2019, fairly intently on uh, doing its part to help address the climate crisis. In fact, after LD 1711 became law, IECG formed its climate initiative to help, as the website name says, getmainclimateright.com. Uh, we hope you visit this, this site in your work because it has the best thinking we can find on how Maine can rapidly and efficiently address the climate crisis. IECG has described, as you are aware, LD 1711 as a significant climate mistake because it pays four or five times as much as necessary for solar energy. That may mistake unfortunately compounds by limiting what Maine can spend on heat pumps, weatherization, and other climate strategies. IECG acknowledges its role in the, this mistake. While we oppose 1711, perhaps we could have been more clear or more effective uh, or worked harder. We're not pointing fingers. IECG just wants mistakes to be avoided and corrected when we as fallible humans make our share of mistakes. And that's why uh, we support Representative Cato's bill uh, and helped work on it. Uh, we hope the bill offers useful ideas to keep substantial net energy billing uh, projects and programs alive, but reduces the harm. Uh, obviously, 
Uh, this is a very complex issue. That's why you've created a subcommittee, now an unnamed subcommittee, I know. Um, uh, hopefully not an orphan uh, and hopefully successful. Um, and we just want to offer these ideas to the subcommittee and to you all and hope you will, will consider them. Uh, there are some complex matters. Uh, first, let me clear up a drafting mistake. The buyout in section four should be of the project or the developer, not the utility customer. Uh, you can see how the mechanisms work. It, it reduces over time. Uh, it reduces, first of all, the size of a, an eligible project from five megawatts to one, something others have discussed. And it reduces the rate over time with the important exception that a project can apply to the Public Utilities Commission uh, to be a full five megawatt project um, at the rate set uh, in the legislation. Uh, based on its achievement of milestones and investment. And that would, we hope, deal with the equities involved in people having gone out and spent money uh, or leasing land or buying land and uh, building a project uh, and, and now being subject to a questionable program. Uh, it, it's not perfect, but frankly, I, I would imagine that everyone is having difficulty figuring out how to draw the line that distinguishes one project from another. And frankly, that's why the legislature created the, the commission itself in, in 1913. It's hard to draw those lines. Finally, uh, we urge adoption of a voluntary buyout mechanism, similar to what was done in the 1990s for much larger projects, which saves ratepayers millions of dollars uh, in higher energy costs. I'd be happy to explain that. Um, uh, I realize it's a counterintuitive concept, but basically it's a lot easier to buy out uh, a developer's profit than it is to buy out an uneconomic project, uneconomic because of its size. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and to provide, uh, for example, the legislation that uh, did the buyouts uh, in the 1990s to the committee for its consideration. Thank you. I'd be happy Thank to answer you. any questions. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Buxton? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now turn to opponents of this bill and I'll recognize uh, Caitlin Kelly O'Neill from the Coalition for Community Solar Access. Caitlin. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I'm Caitlin Kelly O'Neill. I'm the Northeast Regional Director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access. CCSA is a national coalition of businesses and nonprofits working to expand customer choice and access to solar for all American households and businesses through community solar. We urge you to not adopt the bill currently before the committee for consideration and act to reduce the nameplate capacity of distributed generation resources to qualify for NEB and decrease tariff rates for customers participating in NEB. CCSA appreciates the attempt to put forward another plan for consideration regarding safe harboring certain types of projects in the existing NEB program. But this specific proposal does fall short of providing clear market signals for which projects will be safe harbored and which will not. And the parameters proposed for the future of the program fall short of continuing to supply sustainable market support for community solar. The community solar market is, is looking for clear signals <clears throat> from the legislature regarding projects that may be safe harbored under the existing program. While there is some guidance in this bill, there remains a significant amount of discretion left to the Public Utilities Commission. And at that point, it, if the PUC is left to make a dis determination, it will continue to destabilize the market because developers will remain unclear about a project's viability even after a determination is made by this committee. We strongly encourage the committee that whatever their ultimate determination may be regarding projects that con may continue under the current en energy billing program, there be no question about who is in and who is out. And finally, CCSA does not support the details provided for the future of the NEB program, uh, which will not support a healthy community solar market. 
for community solar to really provide benefits to main ratepayers, projects above a megawatt will need to continue to be eligible because the greatest benefits to customers are delivered when the construction of projects benefit from economies of scale. And we usually see that with projects over a megawatt, uh, you know, up to the five megawatt cap that's currently existing. Likewise, most community solar projects are financed based on 20 year terms instead of 10 year terms and limiting the tariff rate to 10 years along with limiting the eligible system size to a megawatt will fail to continue supporting a community solar market for Maine. And finally, CCSA would urge the legislature to not propose any tariff value changes directly in statute. Um, and if there are tariff rate changes to be considered, we would urge you to defer to the Public Utilities Commissions for setting appropriate tariff values. So thank you for your, thank you for your time and consideration. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out and I'm available to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Are there questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Barry. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Caitlin. And um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the tariff rate provision, um, the way that you are. So uh, the, the way that I read section two of this bill, <clears throat> um, the tariff rate would, would step down over time, 50%, um, then 40, then 30, et cetera, in, in each succeeding year as of January 1st. So, so would that mean that um, if uh, one of your members were to build, um, you know, two years from now that, that they would, or, or to consider building two years from now, that they would be sort of planning ahead and looking at that 40%, but it would only impact that prospective uh, project, or would it reach back in some way as you read it? I, I honestly, I was a little unclear myself on whether or not um, that tariff change, you know, which projects that the decline in the tariff value would would impact. Um, so, you know, that's another consideration that I think may may cause some uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow up, Representative Barry? All set. So, Caitlin, if I understand your testimony right, you're saying you would prefer rather than doing it in statute, if we did something prospective for the future, that it be done internally by the PUC? Yes. Okay, good. That is helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. And I'll go on to the next person to testify in opposition to this bill. Uh, it's Jeremy Payne from the um, MREA. Good afternoon again. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I am Jeremy Payne. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the sponsor on a bill with the longest title I think I've ever testified on. Um, indeed, a real mouthful for the Senator to try and get out. So congratulations on finishing that. Um, uh, not surprisingly, we are in, uh, testifying in opposition to LD 1596, as it would create a real drastic reduction in the size of projects eligible to participate in the NEB program. Um, consistent with what Caitlin said, appreciate the fact that it is at least somewhat forward-looking, although it appears it would gravely impact projects that were developed during this calendar year, uh, and that it does create some additional visibility into a future program, but we're still opposed. Um, you know, very specifically, dozens of companies have spent considerable time and financial resources to get their projects ready, negotiate ratepayer savings with their project subscribers and off-takers in response to the clear signal the 129th legislature sent via the passage of LD 1711. This bill would completely change that, um, and these companies that expected um, that they would be able to, uh, that their projects would apply, or they expected the existing policy would apply to their projects, um, and now we're telling them it wouldn't if this were to become law. Um, it would also seemingly harm projects that have signed agreements in excess of 10 years. So what would happen to those deals and those projects? Um, I think it's really critical for investors to hear loud and clear from the state of Maine that we stand behind our commitments uh, and we won't change the rules in the middle of the game. And as we've heard from the governor that Maine won't wait. Um, this bill's message to projects larger than one megawatt and less than five 
uh, is basically go compete with other grid scale solar projects. As I've testified to in front of this committee um, previously, um, two years ago, there was certainly no expectation that three and a half megawatt solar project should be uh, reasonably expected to compete on price with a 103 and a half megawatt project. That's precisely why this committee decided to pass both LD 1494 and LD 1711. There are completely different public policies that underpin those development um, scales. Um, the NEB program allows for residential homeowners and businesses alike to choose which energy source powers their home or business. They get to know with relative certainty what their energy costs will be over the life of their agreement. They save money and support main workers and companies. And it also helps the state to achieve its climate goals. Uh, Section 4 offers the buyout for CNI con uh, consumers with a financial interest in a project. Uh, for, I'm very skeptical that these customers would be interested in that buyout rather than receiving the full anticipated savings that they negotiated with one or more developers. Many of these businesses have very likely already included in, um, the expected cost reductions into future budgets, and some may have even bid future work, and I don't mean solar work, based on the NEB law that exists today. So what are, we basic, what are we telling those folks that they're supposed to do with those deals? If they have bid on work that has nothing to do with solar, nothing to do with energy, based on energy savings they thought they would be realizing, suddenly they're not, we have really interrupted their financial business and budgeting cycle. Um, also, consistent with what Caitlin was just saying, you know, this committee saw fit to set, uh, to vest the tariff rate um, setting authority with the PUC, and this bill would clearly change that. It seems allowing the PUC to be nimble and responsive to any changes um, in the marketplace that should impact pricing is the most logical approach. Um, and obviously, as, as, we've, as we've discussed here, the so-called NEB subcommittee has been continuing conversations. Um, the ideas contained with this, that within this legislation would lead uh, the solar industry down a, another path of uncertainty. So we encourage the committee to carefully examine bills like LD 1596 and the message it sends to the marketplace, and frankly, whether you yourself would be willing to invest your own hard-earned money in our state if there was a potential for ideas like this to become law. Um, certainly encourage you to vote ought not to pass and happy to try and answer any questions. Thanks. Are there any questions from the committee for Mr. Payne? So, Jeremy, I, I just have one. Um, do you think uh, people um, investing in projects this year were aware of the risk of potential changes to the NEB project uh, when they were making those investments? Well, in fairness, there's always a risk, right? I mean, any legislature can choose to make decisions um, as it sees fit. I, I think there was probably a reasonable assumption given the statements that have been made pretty clearly from the legislature for the last two years and the Mills administration, that there's a real commitment to growing a clean energy economy. So to the extent there would be changes to policies that are on the books, I think it would, would have been reasonable to assume they would be prospective. I guess what I'm asking is the legislature came back into session January 1st and they would be prospective you know, this year. And was there an assumption in the industry of that potential risk? I think there's an awareness that things can change, but I, I also think it was reasonable to assume that changes would be certainly at, as of the effective date of a new law, as opposed to bringing it back to January 1st of this year. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Payne? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, we will go on to uh, Kelsey Fiore from Next Amp Inc. Go ahead, Kelsey. Great. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Lawrence and Chair Barry and members of the EUT committee. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kelsey Fiore and I work for Nexamp. We are um, a vertically integrated clean energy company um, based in Boston, Massachusetts and with a, a number of projects that we're developing in Maine. Um, so I, I will echo Caitlin and CCSAs and, and Jeremy at MRA's uh, comments. I just wanted to kind of build on them briefly. Um, we really appreciate that two years ago, this committee passed legislation um, that has since helped poise Maine to be a leader in distributed solar. Um, as you all know, 1711 uh, expanded the allowable project size from just under 660, uh, from 660 kilowatts to just under five megawatts. 
This has allowed solar developers to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the state in order to build, own, and operate solar generation facilities. Projects that will clean the grid, help Maine meet its clean energy goals, and allow Maine ratepayers to participate in community shared solar programs to reduce their electricity bills. I think the component of LD 1596 that we are most concerned with, but we do appreciate, uh, you know, I'll echo others' appreciation of the intent here. Um, but we are extremely concerned uh, about the reduction in nameplate, nameplate capacity of projects from under five megawatts to under one megawatt. I know for Nexamp that would, you know, simply make it impossible for us to build projects in Maine moving forward. Um, we, we appreciate that the bill leaves undisturbed project size requirements for executed NEB agreements um, for, for projects uh, that, that obtained NEB agreements by the end of last year. Um, but really, you know, we're concerned that this cap uh, would impact projects that have moved forward um, since the end of last year, um, you know, and more broadly moving forward that um, this essentially is probably going to result in one of two outcomes. First, either customers are going to see a reduction in their savings as subscriber organizations seek to overcome more challenging project economics, uh, which are really borne by the fact that larger shared solar projects carry additional costs that rooftop and other on-site systems do not. So customer acquisition, retention, and management costs. Um, larger projects allow developers to leverage economies of scale to cover those increased costs while still passing on meaningful savings to customers. But um, I think one of the two outcomes of reducing the cap is that, you know, either you aren't able to pass on and meaningful savings or more likely an exceedingly small number of projects are going to be built in future program years. Um, as you know, many find the project economics to just be uh, cost prohibitive. Um, and so I think that that's, that is really kind of our, our sole concern here. Um, you know, we, I guess we would echo what CCSNF, CCSA and MREA say with regards to uh, reducing uh, tariff rates for CMI customers. Uh, we do think that that's probably most appropriately done by the PUC. Um, but really just looking forward, if we want to have a community solar program um, that, that lasts into the future for Maine, um, we've seen, you know, that it's the, the state is poised for success at this moment. If we make this change, um, we can, we can, I think, pretty fairly assume that we're going to see uh, the, the heart of, of community solar ripped out. Um, so thank you very much for your, your time today. Thank you. And uh, we would strongly urge the committee to vote in opposition to LD 1596. Great. Other questions uh, for um, Kelsey from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll now go on to uh, Mike Parker from Loki Solar. Mike? Right. Thanks so much, Senator Lawrence. Um, yeah, I'm Mike Parker. I'm from Kittery, Maine. I'm here uh, testifying against LD 1596 on behalf of Loki Solar. Loki Solar is a small business uh, in the state of Maine owned by myself and a good friend of mine. Um, we've been running wicked hard for the last uh, 15 months trying to develop five community solar projects based on uh, rules and legislation put in place by, I understand many of you all. Um, and I'm very interested in this bill not passing and uh, generally for retroactive changes not to be made to the NEB program um, I got a, my life savings into it and 15 months of every three minutes. So, um, I think, you know, I certainly understand that renewable energy development is a risky business. I've worked for 11 years in engineering consulting for hydropower, still have that day job. Um, but I don't think it's an acceptable risk, um, to, to expect the people who set up a program, uh, to go back and shred up your contracts. Um, retroactively. That doesn't seem like a reasonable risk uh, to expect. And uh, the good thing is, is that uh, members of this committee, as well as uh, other members of the legislature do agree with me. Uh, Senator Stewart was testifying on his own bill to end the NEB program last week. And he said in written testimony, quote, 
moving the goalposts on these developers at this point would send a signal about Maine's economic conditions overall and harm our business reputation. And I certainly think it's reasonable to think your reputation would be harmed by retroactively changing contracts entered into under good faith um, under a program clearly set up to encourage what we're trying to do. Um, that and um, a letter that was pretty important to the community solar industry released last summer by this committee um, that says, quote, it's not our intention to implement a retroactive change to projects already in the NEBQ. So uh, basically uh, it's very concerning to me, the conversations around retroactive change Uncertainty is a great way to kill development projects. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. That doesn't make my job as a developer any easier. It certainly doesn't make um, my job working with folks that might finance or help us in our developments uh, go any smoother. In fact, it grinds it right to a halt and sends us a significant amount of a way backwards. So I would really encourage folks to look at the best numbers and analysis you can use. Um, there's some low quality information out there that I think has maybe encouraged some discussions that aren't very accurate. First thing, the governor's energy report, the governor's energy office report, uh, just to be clear, it doesn't propose any cap on DG solar. It does encourage DG solar as low hanging fruit to meet goals. It realizes that there will be significant, significant attrition from projects in the queue. And it identifies that we have a very long ways to go to our 2030 and 2050 goals. Uh, so certainly uh, sending us backwards isn't going to help us get there. Um, then the 2020 PUC report um, that con considers the cost of DG solar, but not the benefits. Uh, we we're talking a lot about houses earlier today and mortgage payments. And I think that if I didn't consider the fact of the benefit that I get to live in my house, my mortgage payment would certainly seem expensive. So I would strongly encourage consideration of the March 2021 Daymark report um, that considers benefits, because if you're going to do anything, you probably want to look at costs and benefits. Uh, final point is around attrition, uh, which will occur if you look at the Versant Hydro, Bangor, Bangor Hydro uh, Q. 27% of those projects are on oversubscribed substations. So that's very easy to identify. There'll be significant attrition from a single factor. Many other factors will lead to more attrition naturally, and we don't need to make re retroactive change to maybe right-size this um, situation. So I just, can, I just encourage you all to um, basically honor your commitments that have been made and uh, make any fixes or system adjustments going forward. Because I think um, I've seen all of you put in a lot of effort over the last few weeks, few months, uh, watching hearings and everything. And I know that there's a heart to do the right thing um, and to make some adjustments, but I think we can all agree um, honoring commitments made in the past going forward is the right thing. Thanks so much. Great. Are there questions from the committee? Make sure my mic is on. Are there questions from the committee uh, for Mike? Uh, Representative Barry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mike, thanks for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate your testimony and, and your hard work to, to create a business and uh, to do it here in Maine. I like the name as well. Um, I, I do want to just check that you have an actual copy of the letter that you referred to. Um, it, it, uh, this is a letter from the chairs, not the committee as a whole, um, okay. but just the chairs um, and uh, speaking only for ourselves. And it, it's, it specifically was about 2020. Um, there were uh, concerns brought to uh, the chairs by the Maine Renewable Energy Association um, about the 10% threshold. And the concerns were specifically about the rules of the NEB program being amended in 2020. Um, so as the last line of, of our letter said, um, modifications would be applied prospectively and would not take place, take effect in 2020. So I just, I just want to make sure that you have a copy of that letter so you have the complete context, because um, it, it sounded like you might have been a little, um, um, you might have read it a little differently than it was intended. Sure, I did read the whole letter. Yes, thanks for Great. checking. And it's a good clarification that it's not on behalf of the committee. I 
I have misunderstood that. Um, yeah, and I think that, yeah, you're correct. The letter does state that you're not going to make any changes in 2020. It also does appear to state that you're not going to make retroactive changes. Um, so I would request you don't. Go ahead, Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, I wonder then, since Maine Renewable Energy Association appears to have referred this letter to you, if they also sent you a copy of my press release uh, in late November, early December, indicating um, the projects that were not in the queue as of December 31st of last year uh, would be subject to, to my legislation if my legislation were to pass. Did you receive that press release? No, nope, I'm not aware of that press release. No, nope. um, okay. but I guess there's a lot of different cutoffs that you could use. Um, so if you're talking about being in an interconnection queue as of the end of the year, that's one situation. And I and I guess I would encourage you to consider uh, the impact of potential cutoffs on small business developers like ourselves. Uh, we are operating in a different way than maybe larger um, investor-owned development companies would. Mm -hmm in that we really need to conserve cash um, because when you run out of cash, you lose the game in development, right? And we don't want to lose, we want to win. Um, so we therefore do everything when we need to do it. So if you say, show me all your permits or you're out, that's pretty bogus if you're trying to be efficient as a developer. If you say, show me your interconnection agreement or you're out, I mean, Verson, has, has a lot of great people working for them. They were overwhelmed and it took them a long time to get to IAs. So that's out of our control. Believe me, I was calling them every week. Um, if you say, show me your NEB agreement or you're out, that it, it wasn't totally clear at what point you could sign up for those agreements. And we do have them all signed for all of our projects as of today. Um, you, will, you will delete um, let's say 60% of our portfolio, if you were to cut off any B agreements at the end of the year. And that was, that was never a clear threshold. And the rules around that have always been vague. Great, well, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you did have the letter. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Mike Higgins? Mike Parker. Thank you very it's much. It's a mashup of my co-founder's last name, but all good. What's that? Oh, I apologize. <laughs> no I problem. Of, uh, of Ryan. Uh, yes. I apologize, indeed. Mike. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Uh, let's go on to Stephen Weems from the Solar Energy Association of Maine. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, uh, other members of the committee. My name is Steve Weems, Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association of Maine. Uh, with respect to the sponsor and the value of moving up the learning curve to an improved net energy billing program, we oppose LD 1596 in the strongest possible terms. I, I see the flow of the day, so I'm gonna to try to get on and off the stage here rapidly. Uh, our basic reason for opposition, there are many, and they're detailed in quite a lot of words in my written testimony, so I really invite you to that. Uh, in general, we think it's just a sledgehammer approach to a limited problem due to the bottlenecks in the grid, which are undeniable, and the extreme difficulty of getting interconnection agreements. So there is no crisis. And the suggestion to refer these ideas and others to the subcommittee, I think, is very much in in alignment with our thinking. And that's in our testimony as a principal suggestion. And I just want to use the pendulum image that uh, Representative Chiazzo uh, brought up and that it's important not to swing the pendulum back too far the other way here. And I have full confidence that the subcommittee will come out with something reasonable and balanced. I do want to comment on two other things of, of extreme importance. One is just the impact of retroactive adjustments in the tariff structure on built projects. I mean, many of those that are now two or three or four years old, we're talking about rooftops, we're talking about other behind the beater projects, um, community solar farms, 
many of those commitments were made when prices just in general in this technology were much higher. Paybacks at the time were in the 10 to 15 year range. People made those commitments and are in those projects on the basis of the existing tariffs and to step down the value of the credits for those people would be a major breach of, breach of faith. So I beseech you not to do that. Secondly, uh, and lastly, um, this whole matter of what size projects make the most sense. You kind of look around our, our state, what we're hearing, the scope of the generation that's going to be required, that isn't any doubt that there's going to be difficulties in citing big projects. There's you heard yesterday about the wind interests. There's, there's definitely problems with wind in Western Maine. You can be sure that big mega solar projects are going to bring out people that say, we don't want those because they're just too big or they're going to take too much land. There's no vision of a future that will work that doesn't include a vigorous amount of local, distributed, close to load, smaller projects. And that has to be part of the total tapestry that we build out. Why we, why I was in favor of the big projects earlier today, and I'm in favor of the distributed projects this afternoon. Uh, so please take that into due consideration, which doesn't even bring in the many, many uh, physical and economic benefits of having projects close to where the energy is being used. So I just hope that we don't lose sight of that no matter who we are and where we are on the chessboard of this whole discussion. And thank you for the time this afternoon. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Weems? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll go on to uh, Jessica Robertson from Borrego Solar. Jessica? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am not Jessica Robertson today, uh, but uh, great to see you in the committee. My name is actually Jim Cohen, uh, and Jessica Robertson expresses her uh, uh, greetings to the committee, uh, but she had a two o'clock call scheduled, so she asked me if I would jump in and say a few words on her behalf and, and Borrego, and we are here today uh, appearing in opposition to LD 1596. Uh, we've heard a lot of testimony today. Uh, we have written comments that have been submitted, uh, but at a very high level, we agree with comments that have been made already by MREA, CCSA, Turning Point, and, and Next Stamp. So I won't repeat those today, but a couple of high points. First of all, we do appreciate that the bill does acknowledge the need uh, for safe harboring projects, and I think that's an important point, so we do appreciate that piece. But as we turn to other aspects of the bill, uh, one of which is a reduction in the size of projects from five down to one, we just wanna remind the committee, and I think we've heard that projects between that sizes do add great value to the grid. Uh, the governor's report uh, takes an approach that we want diversity in our supplies. Uh, so we don't think that that's the right way to go. Uh, secondly, the proposal to have a buyout of commercial projects our concern there is that it asks ratepayers to make, to pay money uh, for something that they won't get benefit for. So we don't think that's the right way to go. Uh, the next piece is just to remind the committee, we've heard a lot of discussion about uh, what are the true costs of the net energy billing program. Uh, we've had discussions about uh, perhaps how that's best calculated. Uh, our strong feeling is, is that, that the PUC's report uh, missed a lot of benefits, overstated the costs, and if one uh, does a fair calculation, we think it brings uh, us closer to that there's a benefit to consumers, and even if one backs out some of the economic and, and environmental benefits, uh, that the relative cost to consumers is much narrower than had been stated. So at those points, uh, we would ask you uh, not to go ahead with LD 1596 and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now go on to uh, Michelle Carpenter from Turning Point Energy. Great. 
Thank you, Chair Lawrence, Chair Barry, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michelle Carpenter and I represent Turning Point Energy. We're a small community solar development company um, and I'm respectfully testifying in opposition to LD 1596. I'm not gonna repeat um, a lot of the testimony that you've already heard here. Um, from an industry perspective, uh, we are largely supportive of the comments of EMRIA, CCSA and others you've heard from today. Um, I did wanna take a minute to focus on probably what the, the number one thing that Turning Point views as problematic in this bill. Um, you know, while, while we appreciate and thank Representative um, Kayazu for including safe harbor provisions, um, the, the way they have proposed the provisions is a little alarming. Um, it appears to propose a potential path to safe harbor projects that receive net energy billing agreements by December 31st, 2020. Um, but it doesn't actually provide any legislative certainty for those projects. Um, instead, it appears to defer to the PUC to determine um, you know, whether individual projects actually do qualify. Um, it's a little unclear whether that would be through a petition or some form of regulatory proceeding. And you know, while I understand the intent and the purpose, um, it, there is a key um, need from industry, customers, landowners in Maine that, that there becomes something out of this legislative session that, that um, folks can understand you know, whether they are able to move forward with projects immediately. Um, by way of example, uh, Turning Point has five projects which are ready to start construction this spring. If this were to pass in the legislature as drafted, um, you know, those projects would, would basically have to then stop and hold on construction until that proceeding at the PUC unfolded. Um, so, you know, I just, I wanted to raise that to your attention because I don't think that's been focused on um, as much as some of the other comments. Um, so to summarize, you know, the industry needs clear guidance from the legislature around which projects are safe harbored and which projects are not. Um, and it should not, we do not think it should be done through a process at the PUC. Uh, we do appreciate um, and think that there should be a path to a future program um, with capacity and compensation uh, to be determined uh, by the PUC. Um, and you. so with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank I you. believe that completes testimony of people against the legislation. Uh, we have one uh, person testifying either for or against and that's Melissa Winnie of the uh, Governor's Energy Office. Melissa. Good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the Energy Utilities Technology Committee. My name is Melissa Winnie. I'm the Energy Policy Analyst for the Governor's Energy Office, testifying neither for nor against LB 1596. Um, I think I can keep my testimony pretty short, and we did provide it in writing as well. Um, first, acknowledging that the rapid and widespread spread deployment of renewable generation, including smaller scale distributed generation, is a critical component to meeting the state's clean energy requirements. Um, the state's climate action plan uh, identifies distributed generation as a key element of ensuring a clean energy supply for Maine people, as well as the Governor's Energy Office Renewable Energy Goals Market Assessment Report which recognize the value of distributed generation in meeting our requirements, uh, as well as other potential grid benefits. As committee members are aware, um, this committee established a subcommittee to review net energy billing and distributed generation policy. And we recommend utilizing that established process to consider these issues and recommendations prior to making any changes to the existing programs and statute. We look forward to continued involvement in that subcommittee process uh, and working with this committee on legislation that considers appropriate modifications to distributed generation programs and policy where necessary. But thank you, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. And I believe, um, Jordan, that concludes the people testifying on this bill. Is that correct? That's correct. That's all I have. Okay. So I'll declare this public hearing closed. Thank you all for your patience today. I know it was a long day, but uh, they're all gonna be long from here on out. So buckle your seatbelts and, and get ready. Anything before we break up? Okay.